Greetings, everyone. I'm Dr. Dave Webb, and welcome to our Wednesday edition of the Home Run Leadership Show, our Wednesday webinar with Dr. Webb. We're joined today with a great guest host. I always like to call them a guest coach because we're going to be walking you through a number of home run stories today. With us today is Minnesota principal, Mike Fugazi. And Mike uh, has an incredible background, and he's going to share that in just a second here. But he's not only been an elementary school principal, he has also uh, been a secondary school principal as well. Very few people in the country have the opportunity, and I would even say the ability, to do both of those jobs. Mike transitioned well. He shifted from elementary into secondary. So welcome, Mike. And you want to tell us about your background and experience? Yes, thank you, Dr. Webb. And uh, I think it's really important before we go forward with anything, just to take a moment to thank you uh, for the coaching and mentorship through the years and just in having to reflect on things for today or realizing how much I had been through uh, while working with you and just how unbelievable it is the chips fell where they did and things landed the way they did. So I just, I really appreciate you and, and your work and the gift that you're giving to other school leaders by, uh, you know, sharing the things I got to work with every day for a very long time. So thank you. That feeling is mutual, Mike. Uh, You know, when I first called you to interview you for the principalship uh, together in South St. Paul, uh, Mike was coaching elementary school kids on how to play the harmonica. So I knew here's how cool is that, that here's somebody giving up their weekend at a like a fair in their local area, teaching kids how to play harmonica. And I'm going to give kind of a a spoiler alert here before we leave today. I think Mike has a harmonica in his pocket. Uh, He's got a great Facebook page to follow if you're interested, Uh, but he is an outstanding harmonica player as well. So Mike, take it away. All right. Well, thank you. So uh, I was one of those kids that came home crying when kindergarten ended uh, because there was no more school for the summer. So I fell in love with school right away, which is a double edged sword uh, in terms of being a school leader and uh, knew right away in elementary school that I wanted to be an educator. So I took that pathway all the way through every job I had from youth till now has been working with uh, with kids. I was able to teach at the elementary level in Mankato schools uh, for a number of years. I was a fifth and sixth grade teacher before becoming uh, what's called now they're a mentor coach, but an instructional coach. And as part of that, I got to work in the math department and be the, the math coach for 11 elementary schools and was able to work with the secondary school as things like PLCs and RTI were becoming standard practice in Minnesota and was also housed between a couple of schools to work with those staff around things. And, and really in that experience, working with Solution Tree and going to professional development around PLCs with the DeFores at that time, uh, that was really the catalyst for me wanting to be a school leader. And, and really Mike, for helped. listeners, the listeners on with us today, can you explain what a PLC and RTI are just as you're getting into your intro? Absolutely. Yep. So uh, professional learning communities and response to intervention uh, or multi-tiered systems of support is is what that's often called nowadays too. So uh, to to give the elevator on the, the speech on that, it was really using collaborative teams and collaboration in order to identify what critical learning kids need to have and what to do if they understand and what to do if they don't. And that sort of teaming was my huge aha um, in terms of facilitating learning and not just teaching, right? So generationally that shift from I teach, you have the opportunity to learn. Of course, I love you as a student, but maybe or maybe you you learn a little more about reading or math this year, I don't know, uh, to really feeling like you could measure success for kids and help them measure their success as students as well. So I was really fortunate to have an instructional coaching position where I could give that to others and then enter grad school to get my specialist um, degree to become a principal. And when I tried to make that transition to admin, I actually landed where I'm at now in St. James as an assistant principal at Northside Elementary, which was my first admin experience in a building that had a priority grant, 
which is really unique because they were in the bottom 5% of title schools in the state. And they were in that window of you got a couple of years to fix this or we're eliminating half the staff and starting over. And what was great about that is I walked into a situation with a level of uh, ignorance to maybe what being an admin was like. And so I just came in and was mean, was honest about stuff and pushed on core instruction and fidelity and got really lucky to be with the staff who that's where they were at. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I didn't know if I was making people upset or not. I was just trying to do a good job and worked with the principal that that dynamic was was really strong and and got really lucky with the community and the staff and having a good experience. So uh, that that was- You a- had great results too there as well in improving reading and math results. Yep. And so in the last couple of years, they were even identified as a blue ribbon elementary school. And so coming okay. back 10 years later to see the outcomes of some of that initial mm-hmm. work is obviously super exciting. And I, I'm very grateful for that and to getting to see some of the kids as high schoolers that I had as kindergarten first graders as an assistant mm-hmm. principal, right? Wow. Uh, so that that position was never meant to last more than a couple of years. It was only funded by the grant. So I was actively looking for a principal position. And, um, you know, I, I spent a year uh, in Albert Lee schools in a district that made cuts to administration. And I was low guy on the totem pole. And I had an offer at that time to either work in the district office around curriculum, which was really at that time, like my passion, my strength, uh, that I probably visibly had a different demeanor when talking that than other pieces of the job. Um, mm-hmm. I, I really came from that school of, as a principal, you're supposed to be the instructional leader. And uh, I just didn't feel I had enough experience at the site level to work at the district level to tell other principals what they should or shouldn't be doing. Sure. So I, I, that's how I landed in, in South St. Paul. And, and I remember in that experience, you know, two, two things that really, I, I, I'm going to put Dr. Webb over. So I'm going to humble brag that I had a couple offers come in at the same time. Cool. And uh, just two things that have stuck with me now a decade later is when I told the assistant superintendent in the other district that I had an offer from South St. Paul, he said, take that, you'll like it more. Uh, and he was right. I, I still know him. I saw him a couple of weeks ago. So he was. You, you've never that. shared that story with me, Mike. So that's <laughs> a great story. <laughs> you you know that other day pretty well. So I didn't ever know if that was the right thing to say or not. But now that when I'm not there and you're retired, I can say whatever I want. And uh, the other part of that too was was you, Doctor Webb, had mentioned like, hey, we're just looking for the best learner. Right. And that's my why. Like I selfishly want to learn. And so I need to be somewhere where it's okay to learn and ask questions. And the second part of that why is there's no better feeling for me than helping somebody else get to where they want to go. So mm-hmm. that whole coaching mindset mentality is really where I get my energy from at work. I'm very much an introvert when I'm not at school. Um, and, and so all that energy comes from other people in the building. I'm much, much more efficient when there's 600 kids here than when it's just me in the office staff, right? Can, can, you, uh, can you repeat that one more time? Because it was so golden. What's your why? It's to help people do what? I love seeing other people succeed. I, yeah. I love helping coach not telling them what to do, but that, that whole game of setting them up for success. And Mm -hmm. I I really think, you know, in a sense or two, that comes from just being a student athlete. Like I played football through college and in high school was really lucky to work with a coaching staff that they wanted to see young men succeed and become successful adults. And those personalities became people that, that I really valued and respected. And I wanted to be like, and then I'd like to joke that I played college football and that's where I learned how not to treat people as a manager uh, and what I was not going to do in the leadership position. So, um, right. I, I got to see both, right. both sides of it. Uh, and so South St. Paul, it, it was just, it, it was a long commute. I, I commuted an hour and a half one way uh, every day for just over seven years And I experienced anything that could be thrown at you working in a first ring suburb. And uh, there was just some unique synergy in that a former employee there had gotten his principal's license 
And I had told him about the elementary opening here in St. James and said, Hey, I loved it there. If there's ever another district I wanted to work in, it would be there. I just don't know if that would work out for me. Um, but I think you should look at it. And he ended up getting hired here right before uh, the pandemic. And we were at a twins game uh, two summers ago. We were watching the Yankees. We're big, big Yankee fans. Right. And he was going through contact contract negotiations. So he started to talk about their contract and it was very different than the contract I worked under the first time. And I thought, geez, you know, had I known, maybe I should have tried to go back to St. James. It's closer to home, a little easier with kids going into high school to, to, to participate uh, in watching their extracurriculars and stuff. Maybe, maybe I should have looked at that. And it was like two, three days later, he texts me and he says, hey, the high school principal's leaving. Would you ever mm-hmm. think about applying? And um, right, like, like mirroring that mm-hmm. same energy I try to take uh, working in education, like I, I brought that to you and I knew right. that um, you were going to try to support what was best for me or help me understand what was best for me. Right. Like mm-hmm. it was an IROD conversation right? Uh, and that whatever transition there happened. And I didn't know at the time that anyone was looking to retire or anything shortly. So actually the timing of everything and the transition back to St. James worked out really well. So your current role is what? I'm a 612 principal. So we refer to it as the middle school, high school here. Mm-hmm. And uh, the superintendent here, Dr. Heil, uh, is from Minnesota, had worked in Arizona, had come back. And um, that was somebody too, where, where I had said, hey, like I, the managerial side of being a principal, I know well, the instructional leadership of teaching, I know well, I don't know high school systems very well. I don't, right. you know, I, I can look up how many credits you need, but I've never built a schedule like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't had to participate in any level of accountability or decision making around extracurriculars or co curriculars um, at the high school. Like, I don't even know how well I understand the supervision expectations at mm-hmm. being a high school admin or whatever. Uh, but I'm here to learn. And that's why I'm interested in this, right? Like I, that's the value of this job to me is I get to become a better principal, uh, hopefully. And as we tell stories more efficiently than when I was in South St. Paul, just because of experience, um, or if I got to learn some lessons the hard way, that's okay too. So I, I just, I, I'm at a point in my career where if I want to do anything outside being a principal, I, I feel like I owe it to others to say I've lived in the K-12 world or the pre-K-12 world. Um, and so this is a really unique and special opportunity for me to get to, to have that experience. That's a great, great story, Mike. And, you know, you pointing out that when we interviewed for you to hire, we were really looking for the best learner. So we're going to share a bunch of stories today where uh, you know that if you're stuck with me and I'm the superintendent, you're going to get a lot of science of leadership. So science of leadership all follows four steps. So decision-making follows IROD. Conflict management follows IROD. Team facilitation follows information, reactions, options, decisions, IROD. So you were a quick learner, you heard the science, you started using the science, and I'm going to have you go to that uh, most frequent conversation where you get a parent complaint call um, and the parent is upset. Uh, There's something that's not clicking right between the child in the classroom, the teacher in the classroom. Everyone's doing their best and trying their best, but something isn't working. They call your phone and tag your in, how do you use IROD to help problem solve? Yes. And uh, if you look at IROD and you learn anything about personalities, there's a pretty good alignment there to a lot of the the best uh, practice around understanding personalities. And so let's so, go there for a minute. Yeah, Keep I going feel like deeper, I need to front load that a little bit. Because, yeah, so front load it. <laughs> so if you look at like the compass, where you're, mm-hmm. you're a north, yeah. south, east, west personality, right? And I won't go into all of it, but um, I'm very and much. Compass a- gave me permission to use the compass points type system to build off of for the science that I put in my book. So a shout out to them. 
great science that overlaps on the four points of IROD as well. And what base type are you when you did the assessment? And all these assessments are right on my website. It's all free for people that just want to go to homerunleadership.com and find out their leadership type. But what was yours and how did that play? So I am a first baser, like to the letter. So I spend most of my time in the information stage. I really want to understand things from the balcony view in. And I can usually pick those things up fast, but I ask a ton of questions. And so it's always, you know, what else, what other information, what are we missing? And for me, that comes from two spaces. One is I can manage my work-life stress and my emotions with a level of internal validation. I did the best I could. I tried my hardest. I took the lemons made lemonade kind of mentality, right? So I can't help do things if I don't understand what's going on. So first basers, they just can't get enough information. They are always seeking data, details, information, all the background of the story that helps them make really good decisions. So they're invaluable to the team for the whole data, details, information gathering part of a parent complaint that calls in. So go ahead. And so... Good, bad, and different. I spend a ton of time there with everyone before I can move on. And and honestly, personality-wise, and and hopefully we hit on this theme a couple of times, you can't not let people do the reactions part. Like you have to let people get that out, even if you already know. Like I already know the truth. I already know what we should do. I already think we should go this direction. Like you have to honor that in people, but it's also the part it's hardest for me to be patient with. Now I find that there's absolutely times where like, I want to vent and share my emotions too. Um, Mm -hmm. But, but you have to, right. So as we talk about it uh, specifically dealing with parents, like you can't skip that. So I, I really, you know, I, I got positive feedback as a school leader that these were the situations I did well with. And I would tell people like, I don't like doing it. I don't like being good at this. It takes a lot of time and energy and it's not efficient because I could be doing something else, but you have to be that person. And that's what being a leader is. It means like, I'm willing to say, Hey, there's shared responsibility, but I own the accountability and, 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 and you have to compliment you there though. You you had two great coaching points right in a row there. One is you can't steal a base. So the reason we put IROD on the baseball diamond is so, I had a system to coach my leadership team, my school board, my staff to say, this is the science that you need to follow. So uh, you need to touch every base and fully complete every base. And Mike's first coaching point was, you can't skip a base, you can't steal a base, you can't miss second base, especially. You gotta take time and it seems slower, it's counterintuitive as his second coaching point. He said, it seems slower, but you'll actually get to the home run. So we want to race through. We want to skip bases. We want to go from information to the decision. You skip second and third base, and you're most likely going to get thrown out just like in baseball. So when you get thrown out by a teacher who's upset at you or the parent who said, you just didn't listen to me, you didn't hear what I was really trying to say, Mike says, touch second. After you get information, touch second, touch third, so you can get the home run. I'll let you keep going, Mike. And you, you, you're just trying to get anyone can force a decision through and and check that box off, but like, you're really aiming after the best option, right? Like you want to get to the best outcome, not just an outcome. And so dealing with difficult families to me, like, I don't, I'm a first baser, so I like to get blindsided. So I like things to be screened, right? Like, Hey, if, if, if there's a call to my office and, and the front desk grabs it, like I need some context as to who's calling and why, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I need to, I need to get grounded in what's going on. Or if it's an email or, you know, a phone call, like I don't spend a lot of time in my office. So genuinely I don't screen a lot of calls. I just end up with voicemails. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I want to know what's going on. Right. Right. And a lot of times with a frustrated uh, community member, parent, you know, my first step 
is, is again, the information. So I, I want the voicemail, the email, and then I want to go to the other staff involved and get that perspective too. I want to get as much information I can um, and then start with, with even just staff that are involved, mm-hmm. letting them share their truth, their emotional reaction, and then to run that process with the staff member and say, okay, here are options. I can call the parent back. You can call the parent back. We can schedule a meeting. We, we can share the things we're doing to address that concern. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I can try to give a more concrete example, uh, you know, too, if that's helpful. Um, and then I go back to that, that parent or community member and say, like, hey, I heard you're upset about. And what that lets me do is feel like, you know, I don't have to take everything anyone says is 100% mm-hmm. true. I just have to recognize it as their truth. Um, and, and that allows me to feel like I can help facilitate IROD with that parent rather than participate directly with them, right? Like I want to put myself mm-hmm. as facilitator, not as the, the person having the discussion and the debate with the other person. If you know, yeah, let all. me so let me go to some one of your golden moments. So you got really good at. Um, so you heard the parent out, you heard the teacher out. So basically you said, you know, what's your story and both shared their story. You know, how can I help you is even a really good opening question for the parent. When you go to the teacher, you say, Hey, I'm just, I got a parent phone call. Here's what they had to say. Can I just get your side of the story? They share a lot of first, but they're going to share a lot of second base too. their information with a whole bunch of reactions. Mike said, I then problem solve with them at third base saying, hey, uh, you can call them back. I can call them back. We can even call them back. Our three options, what works best for you? And can we look at the pros and cons to each of those options? So oftentimes the teacher says, oh, I've got this one, you know, or they might say, you know, Mike, I really need you on this one. So whatever it is, you can get to the home run to support that staff member. So a lot of principals not knowing IROD get into conflict avoidance and they just try to solve the problem with the parent on the line alone. So the home runs come when and Mike, you get just got so good at this, bringing the parent in, the, the teacher in, and even the student in the classroom in. So I'm going to fast forward there to a story like that. And now you have three people in the main office conference room. And how do you use IROD to see your way through? So I tend to, so for, for people inexperienced, most of the time you're going to land on coaching and mentoring that teacher to handle the conflict on their own. That, that, that's, you're not going to take every weight from every parent and teacher and right. then be the one to carry that, right? You're yeah. always, you want how do I build capacity? How do I coach? We're talking to the, the really tough ones, right? That are going to end up involving potentially school board lawyers, right? And then, and, and you're, you're coming again. Right. It's most, yeah. Most so it's, that's, it's the situation where the teacher and the parent really can't resolve it themselves. 95% of the time when the teacher gets becomes aware, they can work through it and resolve it. Right. Right. Uh, but a, a few times they're now in the main office, you get pulled in. What do you do? So I'm very explicit with it. And I think that does to some extent come from like positional authority. And I hate playing that card. But in those situations, you're, you can still view yourself as a mediator and facilitator. So I bring people in and we just, I flat out show them. I mean, I've had that chart in my office. Like mm-hmm. this is the, the way we're going to talk. This is how we're going to start. You're going to get a turn. You're going to get a turn. I'm going to continue to ask questions. I'm trying to get us to the, at the end of this conversation, agree to some next steps. And if you follow that, and let the other people have discussion and dialogue around the topic. And you're able to stay in that facilitator role. Not only are you not putting yourself in a position to get railroaded by either party, you're able to keep moving through those bases. And Mm -hmm. the thing you have to pay attention to most there, well, you got two, two, there's really two. You got to read the room for safety, right? Like you got to make sure that, that the environment's safe. And you have to know your boundary when to say we're stopping. And Mm -hmm. so for me, any sort of threat is an automatic we're done. 
and I'll give people a warning about language, right? Yeah. You're okay to drop an F-bomb in front of me, but you're not going to call me an mf -er, yeah. right? Like there's a difference there. If you're attacking me yeah. with words, then, or the teacher or whomever, like we're, we're I'm going to give you the one-time warning and then we're going to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Because you're, they're not, they're not in their rational brain. This process isn't going to work. You can't coach crazy. Sure. And we all go crazy from time to time, right? Like we all have our moments. You're going to keep pushing towards those options and you're going to keep asking questions to make sure that you're not missing part of the story. So mm -hmm. while you're going through that and saying, Hey, share with me what happened. You're going to say anything else. What did we miss? Was there anything else about that? What did we miss? Is there anything else you need to add? And you're going to ask that two, three, four times in each of those steps to make sure that that's totally flushed out. And hopefully the mentality that you're taking into it and your staff is that you are a customer service provider, but you're mm -hmm. also teachers, right? Right. And so you might have to meet people in the middle. You might have to be willing to compromise a little more than the family involved, but you also want to be able to teach the skills and strategies as you go, right? So yeah. you do want to say like, you know what, if it's a conflict between two kids and, you know, th this is an example you get all the time, like my kids getting bullied. And then you as a school staff say like, there was one issue where that kid got knocked over at recess and then they sat together the whole afternoon because they're friends, but they had a tough day. So it's bully. Well, like I know, and teacher knows like, that's not the right word that this isn't a bullying situation. This probably isn't state reported bullying, but it's our obligation as a customer service provider to provide an opportunity to investigate that. Right. And, and to follow where the facts are. Uh, and so that's going to take time, but we're going to do that. And the worst that's going to happen is there is bullying and we have to address with it. And the best thing that's going to happen is we're going to build social equity with others so that we have that to leverage later to help kids learn. And, and I kind of build off your, so one of the phrases that you use was, it's your turn. So the uh, when you use a phrase like it's your turn, the nice part about way, the way you're laying it out is that um, in a teacher parent meeting in your office, um, both get their turn. So what, what really happens is you have the parent getting to share their IROD perspective, the teacher getting to share their IROD pers perspective. So whether it's two students on the playground, parent and staff member in your office, they both get to share their story, their I and the information. They both get to react to the story that the other person shared. Can I hear your reactions to what that the Smith had to say, or can I get your reactions to what the parent had to say? Is second base. Third base is, can we brainstorm a solution to really end this issue and solve this issue? Today is a great brainstorm, uh, like get to the whiteboard and brainstorm ideas collectively from the team. And that's what Mike does so well, is just get that list talk about pros and cons of that list and what people can support moving forward, and what they can't support from that brainstorm list. And that becomes your plan then. That's your decision, your plan, your agreement are all synonyms for fourth base. So Mike did that over and over with kids on the playground, parents and staff, uh, parents and students and staff, students and staff, staff and staff, and so he just got really good at running the bases. So we're taking a lot of time today on conflict. Uh, one, because I think it's one of the toughest concepts and because it's the number one thing that people avoid. But if you can go slow, give everybody their own IROD, making sure that everyone can share their side of the story. Everyone can share the reactions that they heard about the other person's story that was shared. Brainstorm options, create the list. Talk about pros and cons of what moves forward for the agreement and what doesn't, then you'll get to the agreement. And I always like to close with, are there any apologies today? And at the end, uh, it's a chance to really restore that relationship and really rebuild that relationship. And Mike can put a bow on that time after time and made him a really successful elementary principal 
it's serving him well also in St. James. So way to go, Mike. Thank you. And, and um, I mean, it, it absolutely takes practice and you have to go slow to go fast. You can do yeah. it the right way and get to move on, or you can skip it or plow through. And there's, uh, you know, Dave knows this about me too. I, I love professional wrestling and I have a couple of buddies that are pro wrestlers or were pro wrestlers and such. And one of them's become very successful in the field of uh, health and nutrition is Dallas page is his name. And um, I've gotten to know him and, and work with that program and stuff. And one of the quotes he always uses, which I think was maybe originally accredited to Lou Holtz is life is 10, uh, 10% what happens and 90% how you react. Mm. And, you know, if that's, too fluffy in your harder attitude. You can look up David Goggins because he says be uncomfortable every day of your life. And he's much more on the assertive side of that. Uh, hmm. But, but what those, you know, what, what that lesson there is, is your job as a school administrator is to come in every day and find the energy to do the thing you ultimately don't want to have to do. Right. right. And that's your growth as a person is saying, I knew that was a problem. And I found a way to manage that and help through that and help problem solve that. And that's what makes a good leader is that courage piece. You got to have the courage to do the thing that's uncomfortable or that you don't want to do. You can't do them all at once, right? It can become overwhelming. I got these 12 things I really want to hammer out. I can get to three this year. Right. Um, you know, that can be really hard. And, and here's a gift and a strategy that says, if you're willing to follow the steps, mm -hmm. you have a pathway you know what you need to take care of, and you're likely going to get to a successful outcome. And no matter what you do at the end of the day, you know, the research shows, I think specific to school administration, that things generally still are going to fall on a bell curve. Five to 10% of people, no matter what you do, aren't going to like you. They're just not going to like you or, or you, you can't fix it. Most the reverse people, is true, right? They're going to right. five to 10 will love got, you five to 10% who love you no matter what you do, right? You, you said one thing one time and they were hooked. And then most people fall on the bell curve and that's helpful to you as a school administrator. That means you can get good feedback from people. And the trick to longevity is to have a strategy like IROD to use, right? What else was on your list for just the last few days where you're running yeah. the bases? Uh, so we had... Um, I'm kind of smirking because this makes me think of another story too. Uh, <laughs> so I had a department where we had thought we knew where we were going to land with our schedule and the preps and everything um, this, this last spring. Like I thought we were done with that. And I got a really late proposal from a teacher um, that, hey, we want to offer a zero hour section and we have 20 seniors who would be interested in that. And, you know, three weeks before school, wasn't expecting to hear that kids had been even surveyed about this or asked about it or like, I didn't even know it was a thing, but evidently we got 20 kids who want to do it. And so that person was already, they were already at a decision. Like we will offer this and should offer this. This is a great thing to do. We should do it. Well, the problem is like, I, I'm a first baser. I have no eye. I have no eye in this. I have no information. So I made her sit down and we went through it because I knew that at the end of the day, if I was going to say yes or no, I had to be able to feel good about that. Like I can explain why this was the right decision. And so we did, we talked through all the information. I asked a whole bunch of questions like, well, what if, how are we going to man, you know, like, does every kid just get to do it? Do we have to be concerned about past performance, their attendance? Um, what happens when the zero hour starts before other staff run time? What happens if we have a snow day? You have to spend a lot of time talking about the what ifs in my world, and right? So, I, yeah, so compliment there is the longer you can stay to, at first base to get all the information, that's how you get to second. So way to go. So we're there, you know, myself, the guidance counselor, the teacher, the dean of students are kind of like, yeah, we can probably figure this out. And, and the sidebar there is like, my job's managing not, you know, like I don't want to be in governance. I want to be in managing. And I want to help people manage what they do to be effective and to have it have a positive impact on kids. And so if this sales pitch is making me feel like, hey, we could do something that 
uh, either provides a reward to kids doing a great job or provides an opportunity for them to get something that would otherwise be difficult or hard for them to do. It's additional support. Um, you know, if, if it's what's best for those kids, like why wouldn't I want to help with that? Even if it creates a little bit more work for me in August that I would have preferred in May. And so we went through that and then we had options. We had options of who we, who we could offer to, why or why not, what we would do. We started to check those off, right? So then what it becomes at the end is, okay, we got one person from this department. I don't know the I, the R, the O of any of the other department and it's August and I can try to email them and see if they'll respond before school starts. Right. Uh, so we had to be careful about what IROD are we putting in an email to say, yay, nay, what other conversation we need to have. And so it's a department members, can you support this direction? We have this request. Just want to make sure that you can support this. And you got the will of the group from the department, correct? Yes. Yep. And I got responses back that, yep, we've already talked about this. We think it's a good idea. And, and the, the value of that to the greater system is that there were stakeholders in the room to help filter the Pandora's box that could potentially open, right? Yeah. And right. as a first baser, that's my preoccupation. So if we do this here, what if another department calls tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And why are we doing this here and not there? And ultimately where we landed was um, we're going to pilot it here. Great. And then collect data on the success of that before allowing it elsewhere. Because we really, did, for us to sustain a zero hour for multiple kids, probably for the whole building all the time, isn't the best practice. Uh, but we had a unique scenario with our current schedule, this particular class and this particular group of kids. But, you know, we, we, we have to be able to explain to others if asked, you know, why this and not that. So and it's really pilots a really good word to use when you want to just try something new with a department in your high school or elementary school, whether it's a grade level team or a subject area team in a secondary site. So uh, good job getting the home run first with a staff member, next with the department, and then being able to communicate it out that we are going to pilot this to bring your staff on board too. So you started small, went larger, went to the whole staff, and uh, you just keep hitting home runs and after home runs. So I'll remind people, when you write that message uh, out to families or to staff, and you haven't had a chance to meet with them and bring them along, it's always helpful to write the message using the IROD structure. So if you can give them the background information first, and then the reactions, then the options, that we had a chance to look at this, we vetted the, this option moving forward, and we think it's the best for X, due to X, Y, and Z, then you run the bases in your communication and it's received thanks to the science in a much better way. So way to go, Mike. Well, and, and what happens when you don't do those things and you're not transparent and communicate right. is you end up, even if it's the right decision with a fair amount of blowback. So I, I have a cherry picked example that I like to pick on because I know how hard my other admin colleagues work. So I hear when a kid isn't meeting an expectation of behaviors, and there's a referral to the system. I endlessly hear, yep, I called the office and no one did anything. And I know that's that- darn office. I know that that's almost always not true, right? Like if you're in a building that's doing anything well, there, there is probably energy going into that. If you're somewhere really struggling, there's the potential that somebody says no. I've interpreted that, that as code for the kid didn't suffer enough or I didn't see enough suffering. Sure. And I'm not even gonna fault people for that opinion. We live in a time and age where people say things that mean something other than what they're meaning all the time. We hear this with phrases like misinterpretation of CRT or Black Lives Matter. I, I mean, like, we, right? Like Everything. So tell me what you did when they called and the, said, the office just is not helping us out at all. Right. So when hearing, so, so the way to counter that is you have to communicate back 
what's going on. So you have to have expectations. Those have to be revealed in advance and you have to follow that plan. And then you probably need to communicate back that plan. And we all hate doing that because it takes a lot of time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'll do the math of, uh, you know, in in my old position, there's a thousand kids in the building, right? There's Mm -hmm. me. And for most of the time I was there was me, assistant principal, counselor, and then eventually a student support specialist. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you know, three to 5% of the building is really struggling out of a thousand people, our system can't manage effectively all of those problems at once. So if five, six, sevens or go, kids go off in the building and there's four or five of us adults to manage it, we're outnumbered. And sure. so not everything can get done with fidelity at the same moment, at the same time. It's going to probably take all day to pull the kid, make the calls, come up with the, 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 the conversation there, to have the conversation with the parent, come up with next steps. So what's the solution out. there? What did you do? Well, so you have to put in the work to reveal those things in advance. Like you just have to be palms up about it, right? Like here we created, uh, and, and, and we're doing, we're in the process of that here, but in South St. Paul, like we had a student's rights and responsibilities handbook that mm-hmm. said, this is whose job is what, and this is how we're going to deal with kids when it happens. And, and by specific incident here, here's the office response. And so we told people like our job is to, teach people behavior just like it is reading and math. And so we're going to use restorative practices and we're going to try to get people back on track because we don't believe that just asserting discipline on people is really going to be effective. And and the easiest way to test this is set a deadline for staff on like grades or growth plans. And then when they don't turn it in, write them up, right? Like you never, almost never do that as a principal. You want people to be successful. So you would help them with that, right? What I saw with you being successful is when you have uh, 1% of the kids that really do need like a behavior plan to be successful through the day, you were able to meet with the team, run the bases, get a plan in place to support them. Um, And oftentimes the plan would have to get revisited throughout the year, but the staff was so committed to making that kind of wraparound service work for some of the neediest kids. And And then- Super fortunate that in, in, in the last two buildings I've been in, the teaching staff mm-hmm. has been immensely supportive right. of trying to do what's best for kids, right? And we all have our times and moments where we get frustrated, but at the end of the day, almost all the time, pe- people just want the kid to be successful. And, and it's okay to selfishly want that so that your job's easier too. There's nothing wrong with that. And so- I mean, it, and you, been- you mentioned restorative practices too, Mike. Um, so just the four questions for restorative practices is still giving people a chance to share their story, share their reactions to the other person's story. The third base question is a beautiful question in restorative practices, which is how do we make this right? And what do you need? Big, broad questions like that, where people can say, you know, this is what I need moving forward. I just need this to never happen again. And can we make sure that this doesn't happen again? And how can we do that? And then you get a plan in place and you restore the relationship and rebuild it. So it's even stronger than the incident that happened. So thanks for bringing that up too. And uh, I'm just looking at the clock for uh, as we're nearing the end of our show today. Is there one strategy or tip that you'd want to leave people with today as we close? Yeah. Uh, Yes, but I need a moment to elaborate on it. So you don't have to like anyone to be good at your admin job, but you have to love everyone. Mm -hmm. And a part of that means that you have to be willing to hold yourself to a higher expectation than you would hold others. You can't, you can't hold people to a higher expectation than, than you would hold yourself. Right. And so right. it's okay to not like everyone, whether it's a family, a student even, or, or really, you know, a, a staff member, but you have to love everyone. Mm-hmm. And wow. no matter what you do, it's never going to be perfect, but you have to have a strategy for how you're going to navigate the difficult things that you know, you're going to encounter. 
And what IROD does, even in that example of like, you know, no one's doing anything, but you spend all day running those steps with the parent, with the kid, trying to circle back to the teacher. Um, You have to do those things and you have to have people around you that are a part of that. So a dangerous part of leadership is it's lonely, but you can't do the work in isolation. Way to go. And and how about that? You don't have to like everyone, but you have to love everyone. And uh, I got to see firsthand your love for a thousand kids in the building, for the community. Uh, I know that the community down uh, where you're working right now in St. James loves you too. And um, a great opportunity to have a taste to start there and then return there as well. So way to go. Uh, Mike, as, as, um, as being a great leader and stepping up and sharing your stories and gifts today, we have uh, a 21 series video course that we can share with you for free. So we'll stay on here once we go off air and I can give you the code for that. Uh, if anyone's interested, it's right on my website, homerunleadership.com. We always do a lot of uh, great executive coaching, executive team coaching. Uh, as a leader, you want to be able to run the base as well. You want to touch for. But the gift is when you can build a home run system to make sure that your leadership team runs well. Your teachers in your building and your staff run the base as well. So they can problem solve without always having to send kids to the office, making sure that the school board runs the base as well, or your church governing board or your business board of directors, whatever that is, that your teams are running the base as well. All right, as I promised today, folks, uh, I'm gonna ask Mike to just take a minute to give us a great lick on the harmonica. And he is a harmonica specialist, one of those hidden, principal talents. So Mike, take it away and just share with us uh, 30 seconds to a minute of a great harmonica song. I'll see what I can do here. Way to go. How fun is that? And Mike, uh, what's the Facebook page they can follow if they want to follow your page? Mike Figazi Harmonica. And I promise I won't post anything about being a principal. It'll just all be fun stuff. Mike, you helped a lot of people today with your stories, especially those stories of conflict that we try to avoid so often. So hats off to you. Thanks for being a great home run hitter. I'll just remind people, if you want to go great places, keep running the bases, and we'll catch you next week. Thanks, everyone.